Good morning. It is Monday, April 15, 2024. Monday, 10.30 a.m. It's tax day. Or maybe it's close to tax day. Anyway, it's the middle of April. Pretty light data week in the U.S. We're not going to get a whole lot of economic data out this week. Um, again, my name is Rob Sin at CEO Technician on X at Goldfinger on CEO.ca, Goldfinger Capital on YouTube and Substack. I'm going to show you my Substack in a second. But what a weekend it was. Um, what a last 72, 96 hours in markets. Gold hits 2448. Silver hits almost 30 on Friday. And we're pulling back <clears throat> quite a bit um, off those levels, about $100 an ounce off the Friday high in gold. Iran launches drones and missiles, cruise missiles at Israel, um, lands a few hits on an air base in southern Israel. No casualties. Um, yeah, so what's next? Well, a short summary of that is I don't know. But let's take a look at my Substack. Um, some really good content on here. Um, macro, micro, junior mining, super micro, specific company, a um, lot of market psychology, just me. Okay, this is me. Um, so, uh, Sunday, yesterday, yesterday, I published this war risk in the Middle East and its implications for gold and oil. You know, just sort of putting down my thoughts on the situation. Basically, Iran telegraphed this attack on Israel days in advance. The market was clued in on it very clearly on Friday. That helps to explain the move in precious metals Friday morning. But it was very clear, it's very clear now, that number one, the U.S., its allies, and the Israeli armed forces were well prepared for this attack. Hence, they were able to shoot down 99% of the projectiles. <clears throat> so this was uh, more to save face for Iran. This is not really dealing a blow to Israel. But Israel is going to respond because this is the Middle East, and it's about saving face and saying, I won, and I hit the hardest. And this is where there could be miscalculations. But make no mistake, the Iranian you know, regime does not want a full-scale war with Israel and the U.S. They do not want that. They want to continue to poke and prod and cause problems throughout the Middle East. And they want to, go, to grow stronger over time to where they will eventually be at sort of a force parity with the Israelis but they are definitely not at that stage yet. That's for sure. And that was kind of shown Saturday night as well. Um, so I don't know what's next, but there is definitely potential for a miscalculation, but markets are sort of yawning at the whole thing. Uh, they, they realize that this is mostly theater. Okay. Uh, it is interesting, this gold crypto, Okay, this is this is the this was a 500 million market cap crypto. Okay, so it, it's trading tens of millions of dollars of volume, and it did spike to over 3,000 an ounce Saturday night. Now, granted, if it was the gold futures market, the COMEX futures that were really trading the Saturday night, I don't think they would have made it as far as 3,000 because there would because there would have been too much supply to eat through at lower levels. But this does <clears throat> demonstrate. Um, on what a razor's edge markets are sliding on and that things are much more uh, unstable than we realize, quite frankly, everywhere in the world. Okay. And so $3,000 gold, you know, five years ago, $3,000 gold was a complete pipe dream of people were talking, gold's going to hit 3,000. Ah, oh, there's another gold bug moron. Just trying to get clicks, trying to get views, making crazy price targets. But now 
now we can actually say the three thousand dollar gold is a real possibility now, i'm not i'm not predicting it to hit this month or even next month but three thousand dollar gold could happen okay um but <clears throat> the main takeaway for, from this weekend is that we never really want to see gold as as a long-term gold bull that i am i never really want to see gold rising on war terror headlines in fact <clears throat> one of the few times i will ever short gold is when it spikes on this sort of event and you know <clears throat> my my hit rate on shorting gold on war terror headlines is like 90 percent um including last night i took a gold short now I didn't get to short at 3,000 with Pax G, but I, I shorted it close to 2,400 and made a very nice profit off the trade. Uh, now I have covered that trade and I will consider myself to be more neutral on gold here in the near term. But one of the things that a violent price spike on some event, some war headline terror attack, violent price spikes what they do to a market is they uh, motivate long-term holders stronger holders to liquidate their position to take the, the the windfall the big profit and the people buying from them are the hot money traders chasing the headlines as soon as the event is over then all those hot money traders are dumping and so you you then have a situation where the market has transitioned a portion of its holders from strong hands to weak hands. And, and that creates a, a reset in the market that takes time to work through. And I think that's kind of what happened on a smaller scale in gold um, in Thursday, Friday, and even into last night. So we have to reset. I think, I think Friday's candlestick um, clearly tells us that we need a reset does that reset mean 2340 does it mean 2300 does it mean 2250 frankly we you know we don't know um but i think it needs a reset and and the reset could be over time and not necessarily by price it doesn't mean that price has to drop uh, a great deal but let, let's talk about um yeah, yeah so the second bullet point friday was an emotional climax you know gold silver hits nearly 30 dollars an ounce friday morning um that's awesome but we were just at 26 a week or so ago right so that is too far too fast very unlikely that silver was going to get through the 30 dollar level 30 dollar level on the first attempt in 2024 it might take two or three attempts even uh, so that was the first uh, shot across the the the, uh, the bow, so to speak. Uh, and gold surpassing 2400 after just being at 2160 on March 25th. I mean, the move from 2160 to 2448 is happening in two weeks in virtually a straight line, right? So it, it's too far too fast. I, I'm I'm very comfortable saying that, and I said as much in a video on this YouTube channel Friday morning. It's too far too fast and we need a reset. So we're getting the reset. Bull markets climb a wall of worry. In the last five days, I've seen gold bulls get a, a big shot of confidence. And I see a lot of guys throwing around 3,000 or even $4,000 price targets now. Whenever you start to see that, from a number of people, not just the same old gold bugs, but a number of, of sort of new commentators step into the fray and are suddenly very bullish on gold, <clears throat> you know you're going to get a correction. Okay, that's just how it works. That's just how it works. And, and any time that we're feeling really smart, like I started feeling very smart last week, uh, you also know you should probably sell some. You know, you're going to get slapped. Um, so we need a correction. And we need to rebuild that wall of worry a little bit, okay? And so that's the process that we're in. So I, I can, to be clear on timeframes, I can be extremely bullish on gold 12 months out or even three months out. And I can be, you know, neutral or even slightly bearish one to two weeks out, right? And so that's where I am right now. 
Stru structural versus cyclical. So this is a very important thing to understand. And everybody, I don't even have the chart in front of me, but the real yields versus gold price chart, right? And you have the real yields continuing to rise um, and gold continuing to rise, right? And it's, it's a divergence because historically, <clears throat> when real yields fall, gold rises, not the other way around. So we are seeing rising yields, rising real yields, and rising gold and silver prices. This is an indication that this precious metals bull market is stru structural in nature and not cyclical. When it's cyclical, like in <clears throat> 2020 or 2019, it was uh, the Fed suddenly pivoting to easing as the economy was slowing and inflation was was below their target level right so that's cyclical that's a cyclical adjustment in the economy and a cyclical adjustment in monetary policy and gold's bull market in 2019 and 2020 was cyclical in nature but now it has transitioned to being structural in nature with a fed that is restrained trapped by fiscal dominance right so you know fiscal dominance is basically the fed has to help the treasury to finance itself to um, roll over its debt so we cannot hike to 6.5 percent to try to push inflation down right and so we have this sort of uptick in inflation here in early 2024 and the fed is still talking pretty dovish and, and rate hikes are not really on the table at this point <clears throat> now that could change that could change but if it does change it would be a very bad uh <laughs> it would be very bad for i think the overall economy it'd be bad for financial markets it'd be bad for gold um and for the fed to pivot from where powell was at the end of last year which he was laying the groundwork for rate cuts in 2024 to then hiking rates, he would lose credibility, right? And he continues to um, talk as if inflation is going to return to 2%. And this is just a, a, a hiccup in the trend down, right? And that, you know, remains to be seen. And he could, he could be right about that. But the fact that the Fed is still talking about cutting and even June is still a possibility, even though it's not likely now. It's that's getting pushed out to September now. The fact that we're talking about uh, cutting when inflation is still—I mean, even the the PCE is three point three percent, so it's nowhere near the two percent um, goal. And the CPI—I mean, I mean, <clears throat> I mean it, it seems to be on trend for five percent again by year end, right? So. <clears throat> nowhere near the Fed being able to say it's achieved its objective, right? And, but it's stuck. It is stuck. And so this is um, the gold, uh, the continued accumulation in gold is a sign of distrust in the U.S. dollar and um, the dollar as the reserve currency, right? And and clearly for emerging market, market central banks like China accumulating gold, is a key underpinning of their strategy to you know usurp the dollar as the reserve currency okay it is a key uh underpinning of the strategy of china russia you know e iran to um <clears throat> knock down the dollar to um you know, weaken the ability of the U.S. to continue to spend a trillion dollars a year on its military, right? Anyway, we, we could go on that for a while, but I'm pretty sure you guys get that. It's structural versus cyclical. The Fed is stuck. The Fed is trapped. It doesn't have a good move here. If it cuts, it risks creating a blow off in, in financial markets and, and rebounding of inflation if it hikes it risks cracking financial markets and really damaging the economy while losing its credibility if it stands pat which is, seems to be the least uh 
bad of the three choices, then, well, this is the trend of CPI right now. And, you know, stocks are not exactly cheap either, right? And look at what gold's doing. Now, so gold has risen from 2100 to 2400 in the last month and this is happening while gold etfs have lost 2.5 billion dollars of assets under management since the launch of the bitcoin etfs the bitcoin etfs have gained an aggregate of over 11 billion dollars in assets since their launch so this tells me retail is not in the gold trade at all and even high net worth investors are not really in the gold trade. You know, like high net worth investors at, at large are not in the gold trade. They're in the Bitcoin trade. But ETFs, you know, we'd say retail first and foremost are in the Bitcoin trade. I, I would love to see a, a sampling of, you know, accounts, you know, at Charles Schwab or E-Trade. And what is their allocation to Bitcoin exchange exchange traded funds? I bet it's obscene. I bet it's like more than 10% on average, right? Which is which is way too much risk for the average investor to take, right? Um, but there is a consensus that Bitcoin is the trade of the 2020s, right? There is a consensus right now. Gold is definitely not consensus it's not the consensus trade and i had a conversation with rick rule on friday on x spaces that's also on my youtube channel the most recent thing i uploaded and we talked about that and he's very much of the opinion that gold is still very much a country in trade so so this this 2160 to 2400 move yeah it's showing gold got a little more popular but still very much um highly underowned highly underowned especially on wall street so it is very much a contrarian asset class right now um so let's let's delve okay by the way subscribe to my substack i mean come on if you're watching these videos the least that you can do is subscribe to my substack and if you really find value in these videos and you like what you see on my substack please become a paid subscriber so you get to read everything i write and not just the stuff that I make public. Um, so gold, you know, the volatility. So this is the daily chart. You see these candlesticks. We got down to 2340 this morning, right? So, so that was the first support level that I mentioned, right? That would be the most optimistic case is that the correction only goes to 2340 and we proceed to sort of build a base around here and then move back up. That would be the most bullish case. I'm not expecting that, but this is interesting that gold has rebounded so strongly in the last 30 minutes back to 2367, okay? Under 2340, I would say 2300, and then probably something like 2260 to 2280 range. Like those would be my rough levels, just pulling those off the top of my head. Um, don't quote me on it, but I'm... I, Still, we're in a corrective phase. The corrective phase could last for three, four days. That would be the shortest. It could last for three to four weeks. That would be the longest, you know, I would expect it to last. So this is, again, that monthly cup and handle breakout. I mean, this is a straight line, right? This is a straight line breakout. Now, the power of this long-term pattern is impressive. And that helps to explain how clean this breakout has been and the magnitude of the breakout. But that being said, this is a monthly chart. This is a monthly chart, right? So we could spend another two weeks trading between 2300 and 2400 and this chart wouldn't look any different. So you have to, you have to be very clear on your, your time, frame, time frame and put things into perspective. Um, this is showing that breaking correlation, right? Normally, yields and gold are negatively correlated. When treasury yields rise, gold falls. That is the way it has been for much of the last couple decades. This is a very strong shift in correlation from basically negative 95% at the beginning of March to positive 
that is a very sharp shift in correlation between gold and treasury yields. And that's not something to ignore. This is something to focus on and really think deeply about what is happening in the world that is causing that. Uh, silver's up today, right? So this is relative strength in silver. So we have to point that out. Uh, that is that is bullish. That is bullish for mining stocks. That is bullish for gold to see silver outperforming gold like it is today. But then look at the daily candlestick. Look at Friday's candlestick. Wow, that is a shooting star. That is a very long wick uh, on the on the upper part of this candlestick. And silver is a very very overbought heading into Friday's session. So still, uh, I still. Sticking with the corrective phase, we've entered a corrective phase. Um, that doesn't mean that silver cannot be volatile, that it can move from 28 to 29 and back to 28 again a few times over the next week or so. Uh, crude oil, you know, we have missiles, cruise missiles, smashing into an Israeli Air Force base from Iran. And oil has basically moved less than 1%. Right. So <laughs> you would never have expected that five years ago, 10 years ago. If, if I had told you, you know, Iran is going to launch cruise missiles and they're going to they're, they're going to hit three or four strikes on an Israeli Air Force base. You'd be like, that's World War Three. Oil is going to be 150 overnight. Eighty six, thirty four guys. Right. So remember, nobody knows anything. Nobody knows anything. Um, <clears throat> sticking with the bullet points, even though I've been kind of jumping around, S P has gone nowhere over the last month. I mean, just look to the left on the chart, mid March, five fifteen, five thirteen on the spy this morning, five thirteen. Um, we're dropping, you know. Uh, part of me says, okay, so the technician says, look, this is a correction, mostly through time, and a pullback to the fifty-day moving average. You stick with the trend. It's bullish. You, you you buy it here, right? The other side of me says, well, the fact that this market has not gone anywhere in the last month tells me it's very tired. And then I look underneath the surface at charts like Home Depot and Tesla, and I could go on transports, American Airlines. There is a lot of weakness cropping up underneath the surface of this market and the leadership that it's holding the s p 500 up here is nvidia right a handful of stocks a handful of one to two trillion dollar market cap stocks are holding this market cap weighted big index up at these levels the cracks the weakness underneath the surface of this market are becoming really pronounced um, I think Home Depot was one of the best leading indicators you can get of the U.S. consumer, the U.S. economy, the home building industry, the home improvement industry. It gives it gives uh, a finger on the poles, a gauge of all of that. And look at this trend. Cannot catch a bid. Lululemon. So this is one I've talked about trading. This is a stock I'm actually long of, and I'm hating it. I'm hating it. I bought it at 350 last week. And I'm hating, I mean, look, it's been a couple of days. I'm down a few percent. It's not the end of the world. Uh, but I have a stop loss here and I'm fully expecting to get stopped down and be raw on this trade. I mean, this is, and this is consumer apparel. This is for people that have a little more money in their wallet to spend that aren't afraid to spend it, that want good quality. And look, it's just fallen apart completely since March. Um, so that's telling me the consumer is hurting and cutting back. Like all of these charts are telling me that Tesla is laying off more than 10% of its global workforce because it's seeing its margins getting squeezed and needs to cut its cost. So when companies are in cost cutting mode and they're seeing their revenues deteriorate, that is telling you the economy is deteriorating. We are seeing weakening of the economy. Okay. And a weakening of the economy with a CPI trend like this, not bullish, not bullish, okay? Uh, we talked about the gold ETFs, Lulu. So I, I'm just gonna, from a trading standpoint, I bought this for a very clear reason at a very specific level. 
and I have a very specific stop loss. Okay, I'm looking to the left. 340 has been a big level for many years in Lulu. I'm buying against that level. Um, I'm willing to take a little bit of pain, but not a lot. Certainly, if it gets down to 320, I'm out. Uh, that's for sure. Also, look at the weekly RSI 14, also super oversold. Um, <clears throat> so there was some insider buying here. Frankly, I think they are the best brand in yoga apparel. Not everybody agrees with me, that's for sure. Some people are turned off by their, their wokeness. It is what it is. I, I buy it for the clothes, right? The clothes are very high quality. I like the clothes. I like how they fit me. They have a tremendous men's line, right? I like the company, but frankly, Wall Street is saying they don't like the company right now. Okay, so I, I, I have to listen to Mr. Market. I'm not right. The market is right. So whatever the market tells me is what goes. Um, tough, tough trade. But whenever you take a trade against a trend like this, you just have to be disciplined with your risk management. And I'm, I'm, I'm playing for a bounce back to 360, 365, 370. I'm not, play, I'm not planning to hold this for a year, right? But I don't know, if you're a long-term investor, this is an interesting spot to take a look at Lululemon, maybe as a holding to hold for a year, okay? But you need to do your own research do your own work on it and, and size the position according to your risk profile and your investment objectives. Uh, sound like a broken record, but that's the truth, right? Uh, but this thing has really, really fallen apart. I, I've been surprised with the extent of the weakness here. And I, I thought I was being very patient waiting to 350 and it's continued lower. So strong opinions, weakly held, totally willing to be wrong on that. Mind med, also long on this one. This one's volatile. I mean, it's going to move 10%, 12% a day or you know, over a few days. It's it's a volatile one. But it's continuing this high and tight consolidation. I continue to like this technical setup. I continue to like the fundamental drivers of this company. Uh, so staying long on MindMed. There's nothing in the chart or anything I'm seeing out there that has me change my opinion at this point in time. Still bullish on it. Cybin. We've been out of this one for a while since the spike up to 52 cents in March. We took profits on our trade there. Being patient on this one, but this one is setting up again. I have no, I have no position right now, but this one is setting up again. And I, I think I'm a buyer at 35 cents. So if it gets a little cheaper, I think that gives me enough margin, uh, uh, like enough moat, like margin of safety from the price level of the last last financing and of the 51 cent warrants that are out there that it gives me enough upside versus the risk to take a position so 35 cents i think that's my trigger in cybin so let's get to junior mining I'll, I'll, let me just run through some gold miner charts get rid of these Okay, so GDX, do you see that candlestick on Friday? That's a very big bearish reversal, outside reversal, bearish engulfing. It's continuing lower today. When you see that in the gold miners, okay, this sort of, you know, reversal price action after big run, that's your yellow, red cautionary flag. You want to reduce your risk levels to where you're comfortable with. Um, generally a bearish sign for the metal as well. But if we assert that this is a bull market, which I believe it is, you also want to have your powder dry, okay? If it, you need to figure out what's your level that you want to buy AEM at, KGC at, or FCX at, what's your level, right? Uh, with KGC, if it came back to six, I'm a buyer. With AEM, if it comes back to 58, I'm a buyer. Right, so you want to have your powder dry, ready to buy a pullback in these charts, okay? And they, it might not get to your levels, right? It just might, the pullback might not be that deep. Um, <clears throat> junior mining updates. So I'm going to give, talk about three companies: Hercules Silver, American Eagle Gold, and PGX. Hercules Silver, big. It's just sideways 81 82 cents it's not going anywhere for the last couple of weeks uh i did the interview with chris paul the ceo last week that's also on my youtube you should you know listen to that 
lot of lot of meat there. Also on my Substack, there's a premium article. I'm I'm teasing it a little here, but you can read that too. I'm just gonna get to some key points and we're gonna move on. This is as of the end of 2023, 215.36 million shares outstanding. That share count is now up to 238 million. Where did those other 23 million shares come from? A lot of them came from warrants. So Hercules is working through a pile of warrants from a May 2022 financing. These are 11 cents warrants, 11 cent warrants. A lot of them have come in. Barrick bought 7 million of them from a hedge fund last year, right? So Barrick immediately did a full exercise on the 7 million. Uh, they paid 95 cents each, uh, 94 cents each for, so they paid $1. five for their Hercules shares through those 11 cent warrants that they bought. But there are still some out there. There are still some. I don't know the number. It could be as small as 5 million. It could be as many as 10 or 12 million. I don't know the number, but it's somewhere in that ballpark. And they have about another month to do the, you know, the, you know, exercise, right? So, you know, they're coming in because they're 11 cents. They're all in the money, right? So we're working through those warrants, that warrant overhang. Okay. The reality is this was a much different company in 2022 with far fewer prospects and much more challenging cost of capital and financing terms than it is today. And we're just working through that residue, that overhang from the Bald Eagle prior management team and the financings that took place to really get this company to where it is today. Uh, financings at much lower price levels, much higher cost of capital, right? Um, but the reality is, Drilling is going to start in two weeks in Idaho. We're going to work through these warrants over the next month. You can count on it. It's just going to be a process. And I think a lot of the investors are impatient. They're wondering why the stock's not moving up. Well, that's a big reason why. Also, there were some shares held by the previous management team that came free trading. I'm confident that those have been worked through by now. So really, it's just it's just the warrants and people uh, taking some some profits who have a much lower cost basis. Okay, so I'm optimistic that we're gonna work through this in the next couple of weeks, but you know, realistically it could take another month. Okay. I just don't I just don't know. Okay. Uh, the news release from last week, the geophysics. There is a lot to unpack here. I unpack a lot of it in this premium article on my Substack, but I'm going to talk about a couple things here and also some graphics that I have here. So these are these are graphics I got from the CO.ca channel. I think Wynn posted at least one of these. And this one shows that the potassic zone has the highest temperature. OK, so you can just see the main reason why I'm showing this is just the temperatures. So when you get into the halo, your temperature drops to 250 to 300 Celsius. When you're in uh, the moderate py pyrite halo, your temperature may be 400 Celsius. But when you're in the potassic, the core, where there's the most chalcopyrite, boronite, chalcosite, your high temperature, you're above 450 degrees Celsius, right? So it's interesting that the highest temperature rock they have drilled so far was 2305 and that was also the highest grade so the vector the simplest vector is to just follow the grade as the grade increases go that way as the temperature increases go that way right so 2305 is here right so belmont stands out from this news release as the best target okay that's undeniably based on the geophysics and the chalcosite found in the old adit the old dump uh, where the old timers were, were mining underground, it shows up as the best target. It has the biggest magnetic, you know, anomaly by far, high conductivity, right? But 
the proof is in the drilling, right? So the geophysics are not a perfect indicator. You need to drill to confirm the geophysics. I continue to think Grade Creek is the best target area. This corridor right here, I'm just waving my mouse because this is the area that I like the most. So I think one of the rigs, one of the rigs, based upon my conversation with Chris, one of the rigs is going to step out maybe 200 meters northwest of 2305 and then work its way sort of drilling a fence towards Great Creek. And I think that's, in my mind, that's the most interesting one to me. That's the one I'm most excited about. But they've outlined this whole target corridor extending from Belmont to Great Creek. Now, they also talked about um, Big Cut, this, this SCARN and a moderate chargeability uh, you know, anomaly at Big Cut, which matches up with where they have all this copper and rock and copper and soils. Uh, and that's an interesting target for sure. They should definitely test that with at least a couple holes, and they will. Uh, but I'm just not sure it has the scale to be a major porphyry center. But you know that remains to be seen. But uh, I'm sticking with uh, Great Creek as my number one target. And also, you know, this is what the geophysics is highlighting right now, but Hercules overall property package is considerably larger, right? This is just one main area of focus. It's like this corridor right here, but there's a lot of more room, right? And so one of the things that's interesting, and even, you know, in the conversation with Chris, he said, you know, option A, Belmont, option B, Great Creek, option C, somewhere we didn't expect it right and that's that's self-evident that you have this whole area and you have a porphyry corridor um that you don't fully understand yet right and the drilling and what they find from the early drilling this year is going to inform them as to where to go next right this is not a drill plan this twenty thousand meters is not going to be set in stone and they know exactly where they're going to drill every hole. No, they are going to learn from each hole. And as the drill program evolves, they're going to adjust. Um, but this is definitely the initial corridor of focus. And Belmont is clearly just this conductivity is off the charts down here. And the fact that the lower plate has never been drilled. Right. They drilled a couple holes over here, um, but they're far away from actual Belmont in this area of high conductivity. They drilled in an area of moderate conductivity or even low last year. Okay, so they never they never touched the lower plate. One thing that's a little I don't know, hole twenty three twenty six was drilled in a moderate um it, it it was drilled in the con the the target corridor but about a thousand meters from uh the juiciest area at belmont according to the geophysics and this returned uh about 100 meters of 0.75 percent copper and 100 ppm molly so you know that would be consistent with being in the halo uh but we have to see we have to see you know they have to drill it and 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 we'll learn a lot more once they drill it so it's starting in two weeks starting in two weeks and uh we'll get steady news flow for the rest of the year and he, he also uh made clear that they're going to drill through the end of november you know this year so so this program will start first week of may all right and it will go for seven months so they're going to be drilling for seven months. They're going to be reporting assays probably uh, starting around midsummer, and then for the rest of the year and into 2025. So the news flow is really about to kick up um, with Hercules. Okay, I continue to be very long. It's it's one of maybe tied for my largest holding at this point in time. And I I delve into the geophysics and the, some of the graphics that were included in the Hercules news last week in my sub stack. So again, subscribe and read it. Uh, what's next? 
Ah. Oh, also, I wanted to mention this. This graphic is really cool. This was also posted by somebody on CO.ca. And you see this chalcosite blanket. You see the light blue? This chalcosite blanket. This reminds me of that Bornite blanket layer, like the enrichment layer that Hercules has found in a couple drill holes, namely hole 2305. Now, there's a little bit of chalcosite in hole 2305, but it's largely Bornite. This model shows the Bornite deeper down. Just very interesting, you know, the, like this is another porphyry mine. Uh, and this is the model from, from that porphyry deposit, right? It doesn't have to be exactly the same. But also the fact that Belmont is showing that chalcosite that Chris thinks was probably near the water table. The old timers got to it. It had to be near the water table because they couldn't go deeper because they didn't have the technology. They didn't have the pumps. This is interesting. This this could be a similar model deposit, but again, I'm at this point by employing that I'm speculating wildly, and uh, we need to drill. Okay, it needs to be drilled. We need to p puncture that lower plate at Belmont. Test, uh, step out from 2305 into the corridor towards Great Creek, and um, yeah, see what we find. So American eagle gold this is another one that is very exciting it's been marking time since march just like hercules has but american eagle has been marking time at a higher level near a 52 week high near an all-time high that's bullish we want to buy stocks that are above 50 and 200 day moving averages well i'm going to make it really really simple on american eagle drilling starts next month i don't have an exact date but it will resume in may at NAC, fully funded uh, for their drill program in 2024, about 5 million Canadian in the treasury, last I checked. But this um, presentation by Charlie Gregg at the KEG conference in BC, it's a must watch for any geo nerds, any American Eagle shareholders, 30 minutes, well worth your time. And this slide really stood out. It stood out to Nate Smith as well. And this is implying like they're learning a lot more. They're figuring a lot more out. And maybe there's a silver bullet to find the high grade zones. Maybe where the dikes come together or maybe where they came from, which is deeper down, or maybe both, right? The dikes are critical to vectoring towards the higher grade. So they're they're figuring a lot out from the work they're doing during the off season. This is why it's so important. Investors just just go drill, just go back and drill. No, drilling is expensive, and it can it can kill a project if you drill in the wrong places, because then you burn your shareholders' money, and they lose confidence in you. You need to do the proper homework to optimize to optimize the drill targeting, right? You don't want to just push a company into a drill program. You want to make sure they're ready to drill and they really have their best targets ready. Uh, and that takes all the off-season work that American Eagle has been doing, quite frankly. And so that makes me even more excited about this year's drill program because they've had so much brain power uh, really figuring out some of the keys to unlocking the higher grade zones at NAC. So watch this one. Absolutely excellent by Charlie Craig. I think I'm going to rewatch it again at some point this week. And then the final one, before we just make some comments about the new map, the book, um, PGX. So this is definitely one that a couple months ago was my secret stock on a certain blog post. Um, really recommend people put it on their radar. This is searching for the Sullivan 2.0, the Sullivan SEDEX deposit in the um, Kootenay region of BC. They have a lot of smoke and they're going to be drilling uh, probably end of May. Uh, today they announced non-broker private, private placement with a strategic investor taking 1.5 million of the 3.6 million total. Looking at the terms of this financing, I am very impressed. This is what I would call a high quality financing. When your stock is at 20 cents and you can raise money at 36, 22 and a half and 20 
all depending upon you know you know whether it's a flow through or not is impressive okay if you can raise money at market um it's very impressive there there's some um uh half warrants at 45 cents some two-year half warrants so it wasn't long ago we were seeing a new trend of three-year full warrants in the junior mining sector so this is a two-year half warrant at more than double the price the stock was trading at at the time the financing was announced so uh, a plus to, to pgx on this financing and you can see the stock's up 17 percent today the market likes it okay so this is this is one uh pgx one that should really be on your radar and maybe even want to i don't know take a position uh in speculation of the drill program in anticipation of the drill program and speculation of what they might find a lot of smoke massive sulfide uh in rocks outcrop um and you just know this area around uh kimberly and and uh, cranbrook there's got to be another um sullivan or maybe another couple sullivans uh pgx and eagle plains are hot on the trail of sullivan 2.0 so this will be an interesting summer for pgx great great job on the financing guys um us is the largest oil producer in the world look at that the us produces more oil than russia and saudi arabia canada is tiny compared to the us in oil production um this video is getting a little long, so I'm just going to say the new map, excellent book, lays the groundwork, helps to deepen one's understanding of what's happening in the Middle East today with, you know, with Iraq and Iran and, you know, the Israelis, Syria, the history of oil in Iraq and Syria. But some really compelling statistics that stood out to me. There are 1 billion people worldwide who live without electricity no electricity one billion people that's more than 10 percent of the world's population so in the u.s in north america and europe it would be unthinkable to have no electricity there are one billion people out there that do not that do not have it where are they they're in india they're in africa um they're in you know remote areas where there has not been much investment right um well i can bet that over the next couple of decades all those people will have electricity um, we're going to build out the power grid and everybody's going to have internet and everybody's going to have electricity and what's that going to require a lot of metals a lot of copper um, and then you know we talked about how china russia and iran and any adversaries of the u.s want to undermine the U.S. dollar status as the reserve currency and accumulating gold and other hard assets is integral in sort of um, being able to undermine the dollar's dominance, okay? And the South China Sea, we focus a lot on Ukraine and Russia, on Palestine and Israel, on the Middle East. But the South China Sea is a major hotspot flashpoint that I think we'll hear a lot more about in the near future. There's a lot of tension there between the Philippines, Taiwan, and China, and the U.S. naval presence in that region. Um, we have bases in the Pacific. We have bases in the Philippines. Um, U.S. has troops on the ground in Taiwan helping to train Taiwanese armed forces, right? China doesn't like any of this. And in China's opinion, basically 90% of the South China Sea is theirs, including all those little islands and including Taiwan, right? And it's, it's, it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Uh, and, and we need so much copper and so much silver to harness wind and solar at a much larger scale.
All right, so I'm going to leave it there. There's definitely a lot more in the book that, than that, but I, I highly, I highly recommend reading it, and really thinking about what it takes to build an EV, and how many people in the world live with no electricity, no internet, the things that we take for granted. In fact, if they're not readily available, we are upset and angered by it, right? Um, so anyway. Thanks for watching. Again, have a powerful trading week, and I'll see you next time.